Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for your attendance and I see a lot of um, uh, friendly faces, a lot of um, of course clients. And we are actually oh boy. Um, so any event, here we are um, Another day, another, for some, lost dollar in their portfolio. Uh, big moves happened. And again, this week, I think, um, really, last week, just to let you know what, what caused me to do this, it was Wednesday night. Wednesday night, I went to a meeting with friends here in Palm Beach. And I had, uh, the week before, neighbors asked me, what do you make of this market? We're getting crushed. Um, my my investment advisor has me in some high dividend yield because we love the dividend, uh, but I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, what other comments? Um, I'm just going to hold on because I'm sure that it, the market always comes back. Um, and then it turns into, I think I want to get out and take a 30% tax hit on my 401k and use the money to do something else like pay down debt. What do you think of that, John? And you know, without when people come up to and someone and said, "What do you think?" without specific details, um, it's tough to make a a, a, a a it it's like going to the doctor or calling a doctor and say, "I I kind of feel bad." Well, what do you mean? And so uh, <laughs> it's tough for a doctor to give a total analysis. But let's face facts: since um, the first of January or that Monday when we opened. Um, and we had the China effect, and we started to sell off in the Asian market. It has been uh, kind of a rough and rocky road for the equity market. So I did want to get a special investors workshop going today and uh, give some uh, tips and ideas as to what to do. We um, certainly are going to look at some ETFs to follow for you guys and what futures and why we switch back and forth between looking at futures, why we look at ETFs and what are the ETFs? They stand for exchange traded funds. All right. So um, there is some other tools that we're going to look at. Let's get right into it. First and foremost, let's just take a quick moment to review this um, disclosure. First, trading is risky, and many people are obviously aware of that. And this is educational information and we would appreciate it that it is only for the use of individuals. It's not to be rebroadcasted unless uh, we have uh, permission from us. That would be nice. Thank you very much. So here's what we're going to uh, cover in today's topics. Um, I think it's important first and foremost to discuss um, now we don't, have, we don't have one 800 pound gorilla in the room. Now we have several. We have global interest rate differentials. We have bond yields um, and, and, and interest rate yields crashing we have or at least declining by the way might be worthy of noting for those that are looking to save money when you see interest rates down that significant um, you may want to look at your mortgage that you hold by the way and see if it is makes sense at this point in time to refinance and for those newer investors and clients if you had a mortgage from four or five years ago that you got into 30 years, um, you may want to uh, look at converting when yields are down into a, maybe uh, buy that down to a, a 15 or so at this point in time. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Now's the time to look at that, by the way, um, as yields are down and see if it makes sense. So a lot of people, we get wrapped up and we kind of forget about, you know, the obvious right in front of us. How can we start saving money? Well, first and foremost, if interest rates are cheaper, if it makes sense to you, Call your uh, mortgage company, call your bank, and say, "Hey, uh, you know, does it make sense for me to refi it at this point in time and and buy down the debt?" That's the key. All right. So, I mean, that's just real simple things um, that I actually gave uh, advice to earlier this week. And, a, and an individual on Wednesday night, said, "Wow, you know, I didn't think of that." So, um, most people are looking at their stock portfolio and going, "Gee, um, this doesn't look good." And I I know I have Apple. Um, what do I do? And it, well, the first thing you can do is try to save money. So if you, you know, if that's a concern, um, may I make the, you know, the simple obvious uh, statement there? Um, now, what about the rest of the markets, the stock markets? And um, 
what are we using to help us understand what, where, and why markets are moving, and what should we be doing about it now, right? Um, there's a couple of things that I'm going to talk about that I thought that would be interesting as a quick review, because um, since we're not really quite in a bullish market environment, we've been in a bearish market environment, the market's going down, a lot of sectors are moving lower, but not all sectors are moving precipitously lower, we need to address this. Um, what markets are moving up? Uh, this week, probably many people are aware of, you'll hear about in the news, gold. Should we be rushing into gold? Uh, when gold goes up, uh, who benefits? Uh, gold miners. So I want to take a look at, is this now the time to just now switch out of stocks and right into gold? Let's. We're going to look at that, and we're going to look at some historical volatility index moves and to find out what really does transpire this time of year. Um, again, every year is different. And every market environment is different. But there are certain times of the year where certain sectors do better than others. And in a very strong economic market environment, when you have those sectors that are bouncing off of lows, they tend to make more magnified upside moves. In times of economic duress or uncertainty, you may see a seasonal strength or a market segment come back to life, but it will have a more muted move. We're going to discuss that today, which ones particularly are starting to uh, show up on our radar screens. So I want to talk about the high probability trading trigger. Many of you are familiar with my work, and if you're not, it is a trading pattern that is very easy to understand and learn. It is extremely effective, not just for um, day traders, which we use, but it's effective for stocks. It's effective in various time frames, and that's what makes it so important. Does it show up every two minutes? Does it show up every day? Does it show up every second? No, but it's a pattern that I think you can learn after today's session. It's actually uh, something I wrote about in, in a book, uh, which is now in, I think it's 10 or, uh, excuse me, no, tw uh, gosh, 12 year anniversary, I think this year. Um, the first book I wrote was Candlestick and Pivot Point Trading Triggers. Um, we've actually made a trading system out of it, believe it or not, and it's very effective. And I'm going to go over that. I'm going to talk about the bearish one because this week we seem to be populating more and more of these patterns. And that, to me, is a, is a clue of where certain uh, segments of the market are headed. All right? And we're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about an advanced yet simple to comprehend market measurement tool um, that you may have heard about. And what does it really mean? And I'm going to give you some seasonal studies in several sectors that may help to explain things. So first off, this is the low closed OG. It's real simple. Um, basically, this pattern, and, and I, I, you know, if you've seen this pattern before, great. But um, and you've seen a presentation, um, maybe you've dismissed it. And if you if you're not sure of it, then let's review it real quick. Specifically, what I noted, and what we wrote about and published and put out in a copy written paper was that typically when we see markets in uptrends, that's what I'm drawing here in Fuchsia, when we generally would get a doji formation, and what is a doji? For those that don't understand candlestick analysis, and that's what this is, we don't need to know 70, 80 patterns. We only know, need to look at a couple nuances. Now when we look at this, I want to just illustrate that this is a high, that this denotes the low, and it's a range. The hash mark to our left, actually on a bar chart, would be the open. And then a hash line to the right would be the close. That would be on a bar chart. And it shows equilibrium, that the market opened, it traded up or it traded down, whatever it did, it went back and forth. And at the end of the day, it closed at exactly where it started. That is uh, a what we call indecision. After a strong uptrend in the market and you get indecision, it does not necessarily mean that the market is going to fall. It signifies a pause. Now, in candlestick analysis, what it signifies is that it demonstrates the level of which the market opens, and then we demonstrate from which a market closes. And if the market has a lower close than the open, it fills in and it forms in your colored charts, it would be red. In black and white, it would be black. So this next candle signifies simply illustrating real quickly, that's the high, 
That's the low. This was the open, and this is the close. All that signifies is that the close is below the open. It's very simple. What I identified, and that's what I wanted to share with you here today, is that on the low closed OG, after we see an uptrend in the market, we watch to see if the market is going to have a breakout, not by trading above a prior high, but actually closing above a prior high. If a market can close and break out, um, generally speaking, that close above an old high, markets tend to want to get momentum and, and it attracts more money. Money begets money. So people, professional traders sometimes aren't afraid, more, more times than not, we're, uh, we're more excited about buying a breakout than we are buying something cheap, right? Because catching a falling knife tends to cut people's fingers off or both hands in some cases. So what we look for with this pattern, for those that are new and for those that are quite familiar with this pattern, uh, bear with me a minute, what we look for is that indecision. And it's quite frankly, it's if the market closes, and that's what that hash line represents, it wasn't the very next bar. Because what happens to us is we tend to get sort of distracted sometimes. And the markets do, and they have been doing something famously for decades since they've probably evolved. They either scare us to death, they bore us to death, and they have delayed reactions, right? So you think, um, gee, this should go up, or gee, this should go down, and it doesn't. And then you sit there, and you sit there, and you go, oh, forget about it, it's not going to happen. And then the minute you turn your head, it does happen. I don't know if that's if that resonates with anyone and you can relate to that, but the markets have been traditionally, especially uh, in the last few years, notorious for doing several things. Scaring people out of trades, boring you out of trades, and then you're in the trade and then you get out and then delayed reaction, it happens when you least expect it. So with this particular pattern, kind of like in the same feeling, right? You might not get the candle right after it, it might not have the, in this example, this is candle or bar number two, this is bar number one. This is the formation that happened, and this is bar number two. In this case, we closed below the low of the doji after the second bar. And this, my rules always state within three bars. Now, what's great about this system or this methodology, friends, is real simple. It tells us real neat things what we need to do. It tells us, A, when to look for a short position because the momentum has changed. B, it tells us where to place a stop loss if we are wrong. If the market is going to erode and move lower, we know that we can initially get in and initially place a stop at the swing high. And that's what we generally talk and teach people in our general mentoring classes and how we actually help derive a trading system to automate these types of uh, trades. Now it's up to us to try to figure out where, and then you, you need to manage the trade when it starts to move off. So an option trader, this is what's really, really neat. There's a lot of option writing strategists out there that say, well, you know, I need duration. Let me ask you a question. If you had a pattern that you could identify that you know should give A, when the trigger exam it ha happens, when, if you're wrong, managing risk is always the key to success. Managing risk is the key to success. If the market, two bars later, came all the way back up and closed above this high, you'd be wrong. And so then you'd be able to get out of the trade, right? And for an option writing strategist, if you could identify that type of pattern, what would you might want to do? Sell some out-of-the-money calls? You would know that you probably should see immediate results. Immediate results mean, I don't want to see the market just linger here for a day or two. Um, it might, but I want to see effectively immediate results within the next couple time periods. I want to see this market go down. So if I have the trigger for a day trade, that works well. For a position trader or an option writing strategist, this works extremely well. Um, you know, we had one of these patterns earlier this week in a small little company. Many of you are familiar with Facebook, right? Um, and it was actually one of the patterns that we put up in our own trading room and gave people an idea what to do. So um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to go up and I'm going to just put up 
Facebook here real quick because um, just so that you could see the pattern and how it evolved, right? And this is one of the things that on an intraday basis, um, I think end of day traders, intraday traders, everyone can kind of identify um, with what I just pointed out. That was a doji. What are the rules? After an uptrend, we had a doji. In fact, what we've done is we've color coded. You can see where it is maroon. That signifies that it actually is an official low close doji trigger. So if you're thinking, well, maybe we could come down and uh, uh, there's a gap here. What is a gap? A gap is simply a price measurement move on the chart where there is a hole or a space between where a market has a high one day and a low the next you can clearly see there's a major difference between those two price points of interest from that day's low to that day's high left this gaping hole wide enough to drive a I don't know a New York City cab through right something like that big hole so as the market that acceleration to the upside was based on earnings no doubt about it so as an end of day trader or an option writing strategist this would be a great way to say, gee, if the market just stalls, pauses, and moves lower, I might want to look at selling some out-of-the-money call options there if you're an option writing strategist, right? So I did want to make sure I mentioned how does this pattern work, how is it effective, and can you scan for it? And the answer is simply yes. I mean, Facebook's uh, you know, kind of notorious. It had the same little pattern back over here, as you can see, back in November. Right? And another thing, it gapped higher, and what did it do? It eventually came down and filled the gap. So we have these really powerful set of patterns that you can look for, and this is an end-of-day chart. So then you can kind of look at certain names as you go across, and if you ever see that pattern, and quite frankly, we are seeing that pattern um, formulate in a lot, in a lot of names. Um, it's such a powerful pattern that we created a scanner for it. We have, as you can see here, uh, the high closed OG is the opposite pattern, but we have low closed OGs. We have different conditions. We have weekly time frames. So can you imagine if I if I populated a chart, even on a monthly basis? Um, how many people remember Amazon? And or have heard of Amazon? Amazon or used Amazon? <laughs> That's that really was a dumb question. I apologize, but. After I've just taught this pattern, the reliability. Now, what's kind of interesting is on a monthly basis, now that we just looked at a, a, an example of a daily chart, this is a definition of an uptrend. I'm sure everyone would agree. That everyone now knows what a doji is. That's the low, and the market on a monthly basis closed below the low of the doji on a monthly basis. An option writing strategist would probably have the idea that the close to the open or the high above the high is going to be my initial risk. That might be too much risk to sell that stock outright, but one certainly would have the idea that we should see some immediate downside. So a monthly option writer is now looking at at least one to two bars so that you know that how much time do you need and which option may you want to write to collect more premium. So I wanted to address the uh, pattern that seems to be very prevalent. Um, when I look at this pattern like we had also um, back in 2013, we saw a multiple month decline that worked. So while you continue to see the movement, and, and again, um, as we start to look at Amazon pulling back, um, one thing I wanted to make mention to you is, you know, how much further can this stock go? Well, we do have a lot of support longer term closer to like the 400, 425 level. Can Amazon get there? Um, that's $100 from here, folks. That's $100 from here. Um, I don't know if it's going to get there uh, immediately, and if it does, immediately means in the next 60 days, right? But it's certainly, as you can see, I've drawn in there, it seems to be following a trend path. This would be uh, quite frankly, not a surprise to see it back down in there, and I would not repeat, not start selling if it dropped down there immediately, right? One of the reasons is as this market movement, which is different from this time over here, 
we started to see the market break down and started to see a volume move um, start to fall apart with that that movement and then it just went sideways for a year and a half and then exploded to the upside if you can see what I've just drawn in there so when we look at chart patterns and I think it's very easy for someone to look at their portfolio and even look at for what I want to address is how many of you have a portfolio you don't look at it every day you have a 401k and or you've put money into it and you're down and everyone's looking at those statements don't get me wrong I mean everyone you hear the nightly news you're on uh, Google Yahoo Finance everybody's you the nightly news for gosh sakes right everyone now knows that crude oil is uh, you know goes down so does the stock so everyone's regular everyday people are conditioned to watching that relationship as it's been existing for the last few weeks what's funny is that more people are prone to look at the macro and listen to the news and then look at their statement but not pick through that statement to find out what it is that's in that fund or segment that they're in are you in an aggressive growth are you in conservative are you in a bond fund you need to understand if the term is aggressive growth you're probably in what something that moves aggressively what moves aggressively? Something that's very volatile. Recently, you have biotechnology stocks in the last few years that have been very volatile. You have technology names that everyone loves. After yesterday, um, we had a significant stock called, and I'm going to uh, just point this out to you, LinkedIn. LinkedIn had a, um, a significant decline. What's uh, interesting is that while if you were in a fund that loved LinkedIn up here, um, you're going to see, and depending on their uh, performance, LinkedIn is all the way back down almost to where it IPO'd initial public offering price, right? So it's already come all the way back down. Now, I'm looking and sharing with you at a monthly chart, and I'm also showing you on a monthly chart another very important, powerful tool because markets and stocks are not just about price alone. They're about the participation rate. And we call it, and one tool that I look at is volume. And I find it interesting that while the market, you know, it was down in the overnight session around 50 bucks, and then it was 70 bucks, and it just kept falling and falling and falling. I mean, if you had bought it at 130, thinking it couldn't go any lower, um, you know, then you're going to love the stock when it, it, it traveled to an intraday low down here um, at around 10, uh, as you can see, that 107 handle. Um, boy, that, that didn't bode well very for, for a lot of folks, right? So just to, just to view data window here, as you can see, actually we made a low, of, and I thought that was true, we saw an intraday low close to 103, and we did, 102.81, 102.81. Let me change this up to an intraday chart and just to show you the magnitude of what people might have done yesterday. And I'm going to just change it to a 15 minute chart. So the market opened up, can't go any lower from 120, you know, got a little dead cat bounce, then it went uh, continuously lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, maybe that was the flush. And as you can see, a very small uptick move yesterday occurred. A very small uptick move occurred. We had a big kind of maybe a little bit of some short covering and maybe some fresh buying towards the close. Um, but this is a stock that I just want everyone to, to identify with. While it may have overshot the runway to the downside, and if we take a, a, a just a look at some of the current markets that we're seeing, they're, they're dynamic moves that are happening all at once and this is no surprise when you see certain names because it has dynamic moves it makes dynamic moves it makes dynamic moves relative to its overall trends and then yesterday it may have overshot the runway a tad I'll say that for sure but to be honest with you a true investor is going to look for some stabilization and anytime that we see markets that I mean on average 
I'm going to say maybe eight and a half times out of ten. When markets gap down, people you start to see markets consolidate a while. People need to grasp their hands around the fundamentals of of the picture, and then maybe you get a move up, and you know you you go from there. But this is a daily chart. This is a stock LinkedIn probably in a lot of people's portfolios that's going to not bode well when they open those uh, statements over this weekend. So I just wanted to kind of illustrate a few things um, and and say, guys, this, this market is dynamic. Another thing that I want to jump right into is the volatility index. You'll probably hear a lot about this and you look at the volatility index and it's surprising that uh, some people might not realize that um, it peaks out the seasonality. We can take a look at the seasonalities because the seasonality of the trend of markets. Certain times of the year, we have supply-demand functions. Right now, I think there's a lot of demand to find buyers. Right? I mean, there's a lot of supply out there, and there's not a lot of people willing to want to step in with fresh money to say, you know what? I think there's great valuation in a lot of these stocks. Let's just get in there and buy them. Some of the technology names, like a LinkedIn, like the Amazon, like the Facebook, these names are they were they were a little heavily priced. Okay, so when we take a look at seasonality, and I'm just taking a look at an average time of the year, we typically see the volatility index make new highs, or as we get into that July August time frame, and that's generally when we see um, volatility start to rise. Is in July, and this year was no exception. And then we start to see the volatility contract, and then it kind of picks up a little bit, which it has right now in February. So I want to take a quick look at the volatility index with you guys, if you don't mind. And if you don't know what the volatility index is, it's, it's called the fear index, many people call it. Let me just get a, a blank chart. Or try to. And bear with me a second. I think I'm going to take a pass on the volatility chart this week um, just for the sakes of, of sanity. There might be a conflict between the um, the difference of market movements here. Um, a couple things that I do want to put, point out to you guys. Um, volatility this this year, and there is the um, and oops, bear with me. I'm on it. There are these things called inverse ETFs that we can kind of take a, a look at. Inverse ETFs relative than looking at um, the market from a sense of volatility, which by the way, the volatility index did not rise. One would think the VIX should be with the way the market moved on Friday, looking at where we are relative to the overall stock market, the VIX should be a lot higher. So it's, it's, it's kind of showing that we don't have a lot of overall enough fear in the market, which is compelling. This is an inverse ETF, a, a technique that we use in our own trading room. And part of the topic today was to say what sectors and ETFs or futures markets should we follow and to watch. Well, here is one would expect, this is the um, ETF, it's called um, the SDS. It is, as you can see, ultra short. It's a, it's a two-timer, we call it. So um, with that said, it's two-time inverse ETF. When the S&P 500 goes down, this goes up. And if everyone was afraid that the stock market's going down, well, granted, we did generate a buy signal. And you can see clearly that the trend is up. And you can see clearly that the trend is up from the beginning of the year. This was what we did. We pulled back. And now here's what happened on Friday. But this is what I'm looking at, the condition of this rally. There's not a lot of volume behind there. So markets without volume can be tricky. They can move up exceedingly higher than we anticipate, 
but boy, if money doesn't come in and if volume doesn't come in, it's going to be a very short-lived move to the upside. So that's one of the um, ETFs that I, I want you guys, if you're not familiar with looking at, maybe if you're, you're looking at the overall stock market, right? If you're looking at the stock market, you're looking at the S&Ps, um, maybe take a different point of view because a lot of the hedge funds and professional traders will be following and be looking to invest to protect and hedge their accounts with SDS. All right. So I wanted to just go over that real quickly with you. Um, in addition, what I wanted to plan for you guys today get this up one more time. Okay, so VIX, why aren't we screaming again into the upper 30s? Uh, it didn't really, I think people are not really all that convinced that this, the market is ready to drop down. So let me introduce to you a couple things today about seasonal analysis and another tool that we talked about that I think is relatively easy to follow. It may be, uh, it, it's considered to be, uh, for some technical traders, a little advanced, okay? And I think that's one of the things that we want to look at of how to really gauge what's happening in the marketplace right now. And we call it the participation or the breadth of the market. Seasonal analysis helps us to focus on what markets have done in the past. You know, the typical seasonal year-in, year-out supply-demand functions. Now again, remember I said earlier that under certain periods of time, if we have economic weakness and you're in a seasonally strong period of time, you're not going to expect a really strong magnified rocket ship launching type of move, right? If we're in a period of doom, gloom, fear, um, you know, markets that enter a seasonally strong period of time might have more muted moves. to the, And, and we have to be aware of that, right? I've already discussed one certain volume indicator, it's the, uh, as I showed with you today, and it helps us uncover that participation. Um, I think we have futures-related products that we can look at the open interest. That means how many contracts are actually open? Are, are there really buyers coming to this market, or is it just maybe algorithmic traders? Let's not call them high-frequency trader. Let's call them the algorithm traders those that have trading systems and they're running it by computer and if X happens and Y happens and this happens and it moves and price crosses Y axis and it happens over X period time then enter long if not enter short and that's kind of the algorithm if you think about it what are algorithmic uh, terms it's just your computer coding certain things what are the certain things that we have to look at in the market what kind of fantastic information do we have? Well, we have volatility, we have rate of change, which is price over time. And what is price? Price is defined as the high, the low, the open, the close. And it's just a combination of time and price, if you think about it. And another uh, factor would be, of course, looking at in stocks, you have volume and you have breadth. How many stocks are moving up or down with the overall index? So this is where our environment has become extremely sophisticated due to the age of internet, online trading, computer programming. And with that said, that's what's really been driving the market. Funds today, and I teach this to all my students, it is amazing to see the lightning speed in which a mutual fund can move in and out of a basket of sectors, not just stocks, but sectors of stocks at a snap of a finger. So it is something that has been happening over the last two years that everyone's chasing the term alpha, which meant high performance or performance is what it really kind of narrows us down to. And they're looking to beat the odds and the next guy and they're trying to get the best portfolio performance. And so I want to explain what are you guys up against and it's not like investing like it used to be 
it's on steroids right now. And you need to really address your portfolios and you have to take a look at certain areas and what you're in. And now, with that said, what I want you guys to kind of look at, if I could, if I can, I want to focus that on, on a couple segments of the markets that this particular week, or it actually started last week, something that we were talking about in our own trading community. Um, this is a seasonal trend of materials. Look at the typical names that you see here. Uh, Newmont Mining's up there, NEM. Well, we know that's a gold miner. Uh, FCX, which, you know, it was in the news the other day because it was up sharply, right? I think, what was it up? 20%. Uh, but, you know, let's take a look at FCX real quick and go back in time in history. So I'm going to go to a monthly chart. And I'm going to look at FCX. And I'm going to say, uh, when you see a stock and they talk about it being up, a bazillion percent just understand where the heck is the stock come from if it was up 20 percent and it's a forty dollar stock that's something special if it's up 20 percent on a five dollar stock you know um, not not as much uh, or a four dollar stock or as it was and again this is a monthly chart so um, you know not not so much of a big move right but I think it's important to understand if you come into your portfolio and you see that you have a lot of material stocks and you're getting frustrated with the market right now, I want you to understand something. The material stock didn't just start to sell off, and this is a monthly chart. The, some of these material stocks didn't just start to sell off at the beginning of 2016. They actually peaked way over here in 2011. Let's look at the sector ETF itself. It's called the XLB. And as you note, the XLB, lo and behold, a little uh, interesting um, scenario here. As you will see, XLB had that little uh, pattern, incidentally. How many people can identify the pattern up there, right there? When did that happen? In the middle of 2015. So. The material sector just didn't all of a sudden, while it was a disaster, it is still actually, material sector is still back to the lows of, of July area in that summertime. It's not something that just started to fall out of bed, right? It already had fallen out of bed. So I want everyone to kind of take a gander of their portfolios and understand what is your portfolio weighted, what's in it? Just open that statement up a little bit more, look at what's in it, and before you get ready to say, I'm throwing a baby out with the bathwater, understand what the heck's in your portfolio, because this is actually an interesting uh, situation that we're starting to see high price valuation sectors like technology getting beat up, and you're starting to see the actual material sector start to come alive, all right? And by the way, it's not just looking at... Uh, as I pointed out, Freeport MacMoran. Let's look at Dow Chemical, right? So in the last, with with Friday's move, I didn't mean to cherry pick Dow. It just came up on my 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 thought in my head. Um, with Friday's big stock market sell off, look at the Dow Chemical. Let's take a look at, um, as we know, Dupont and Dow. They're kind of uh, taking each other. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a different situation. Uh, New Corp, um, you could take a look at um, ETN, which was one of our preferred uh, trades for this week, by the way. Uh, ETN had special earnings, and actually stock went up on the day Friday. So what I'm trying to share with you is that let's go and take a, a quick gander at some of the names here. Uh, from a longer-term perspective, it didn't just sell off last week. In fact, we're finding some buying nibbling coming into this segment of the market. So before you start to shed your 401k and get scared, I do agree you should be scared about certain segments of the market, but not all segments of the market before you start dumping a portfolio. It's important that we go and start to look at not just the seasonality and the characteristics of the market, but find out in order to figure out where the market might go, ask yourself where the hell has the market come from? And that might give some investors a little bit better um, 
idea of what to look at and what stock segments to look at. Real quick, you see a couple names here in the ag space. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with a company called Monsanto, right? Um, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting situation. Here's the monthly chart. When did, by the way, I'm sure everyone can kind of uh, come to the idea that you saw another little pattern up here that already manifested itself. See the doji? And do you see the low closed doji, the maroon? Well, this stock didn't just peak out a few weeks ago, right? Uh, you could see it peaked out again last year. What did it do over the last couple weeks, or what did it do particularly uh, this week? Uh, interesting, right? So I'm showing that not all segments of stocks are going down, and not all sectors are going down. It looks like what are we seeing? Um, run for the hill and the overvalued stuff, and then the, the, the stuff that's already gone down that's starting to enter a seasonally strong period of time, maybe we're starting to see some, uh, as this shows, nibbling going on in the marketplace um, or that sector rotation. So there is something I think that we need to kind of prepare for as we move forward. Um, this is the industrials, the industrial sector. It too has a kind of a lift off type of seasonality to it in this time frame. And let's take a can, kind of a look at what happened. Let's take a look at, uh, I don't know, UPS. Uh, let's take a look at 3M and, and Caterpillar. I mean, so I'm going to just take a look here real quick, C-A-T. Um, Caterpillar didn't just break down at the beginning of this year either, right? So if you can take a gander here, you can see while we didn't get that pattern, the low closed doji, we noticed that this thing peaked out almost uh, literally a year and a half ago. What did it do oh, recently? Um, recently, Caterpillar has started to move up. Um, and in fact, yesterday, it was positive. Um, how about 3M? Oh, goodness gracious. So while everyone in the news is focusing on, hey, check out, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn and, 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 and Amazon and Facebook, maybe those stocks were a little overvalued and perhaps we're seeing some strength came, coming in to some industrials. Now this is a really, um, I, I'm not going to tell anyone to go chase this right this second, but I would tell you to definitely take a look. This is AK Steel, right? Let's take a look at STLD. I'm looking at the if you the, if you're not familiar, this is the steel companies, and then everyone's familiar with the big old symbol X, which is U.S. Steel. Um, uh, a, a, a funny nomenclature or reference that came in the uh, Godfather movie, if you recall, when they're in Cuba and they uh, said we're bigger than uh, was it bigger than U.S. Steel. Anyway, so uh, anyone is almost bigger than U.S. Steel right now, but it didn't peak, peak out in January. In fact, it's starting to nibble at the bottom down in here. Uh, I'm not saying that now's the time to buy this because we want to see the market lift off, but I am starting to see some nibbling going on, and it is actually in a sector that starts to provide some upswings. Um, some of you guys may have looked at a commodity, uh, and maybe it was in the news this week. Um, copper prices. Copper prices started to see a peak, um, not this year, but way the heck over in 2011. So as a manufacturing and a demand for uh, a material, right, because it is a material, uh, it, it really hasn't seen or sprung to strong life. But in an, a global economic contraction period, one would expect copper prices to go down a little bit further. Because quite frankly, they have been lower, and it can get lower, and we've seen it lower, but sometimes it doesn't stay down there. So maybe we're just seeing a shift in our economy and demand needs for certain things. I think we need to be paying attention to maybe balancing your portfolio and find out what the heck's in that portfolio. All right? So when we look at the industrials, I'll do a couple more just to, to share with you. You know, so that I don't. Let's go with HON. I'm not sure Honeywell is, um, uh, I, I agree with it as an industrial, but it is. And, you know, Honeywell is not reminiscent of LinkedIn. Honeywell is, in fact, um, if you take a gander here with me, it's one of those stocks that 
quite frankly, hasn't really done anything. It hasn't really broke. It's not near its lows. Uh, it's just sitting here. It's formed a doji this week, just yesterday. So, you know, jury's not out on this, but it hasn't conformed with the overall downside in the market. Another one that's in here, which I'm not sure I really agree with, but it's Boeing. Um, and I guess it is an industrial. They, they make airlines. So that's a, airplanes, excuse me. But ironically, it, it's actually had a, a little bit of lift off over the last uh, few, um, last week, this week kind of thing, bottoming out over in here. Uh, while it's not seen tremendous growth, we need to see more of a defined trend. It's not like some of the other names. But what I am pointing out to you guys is that we are seeing, um, you know, some of the names and in in that industrial sector uh, do pretty well. Now, here's what's interesting: technology. Technology uh, this time of year, probably the worst time of the year, peaks out. You don't see great uh, things except for two names that pop on the screen: AT and T and Verizon. But um, IBM. Microsoft, Apple having some problem, Google having a little bit of a problem, Oracle, Intel, Qualcomm, Cisco, some of these names in the uh, uh, the technology. Um, just to prove a point to you guys, let's take a look at if you have not been looking at some of all the sectors and if you're just focused as a day trader in e-mini SPs, um, might I point out to you that, or if you're a swing trader, may I point out to you that there's not a, uh, a, a real, and this could be indicative of why we do not see a very uh, strong volume move in pr some of these inverse ETFs like SDS, because maybe not all stocks, as you can clearly see with Boeing, going back since um, October of 2013, they're more in a what? A wider range of... Uh, boxed, as we would call it, or a trading range in the market, right? So let's take a look at, at Boeing. Here's the longer term. Strong upside, and yes, it's chopped around. If you bought it up here, problem. Um, I don't think anyone now will ever buy a stock when they see that monthly low close doji. Uh, but now that the market's down against this base, right, it's against this base, maybe this is kind of what's really causing concern with the market. This basing action, it's actually what supporting against an old low from 2007 uh, or old high excuse me everyone can see that just on a simplistic chart perspective well granted it's not in a strong trend it's in a sideways trend and has been so since what right here 2013 i'm going to go one more for you i'm going to i'm going to hit the transportation sector this is the iyt and the transportation sector didn't just start selling off in January. It actually peaked in uh, November, late November, early December of uh, over a year ago, or actually we can count now and say uh, 15 months ago, more or less. Okay, So 15 months ago, the transportation stock segment of the market did start a decline. Um, and you know, looking at transportation this week, while it hasn't seen aggressive upside, it's not conforming with the downside of the market. So I think it's important that A number one, we take a look at um, some of our uh, portfolio, what you're actually in, and, and, and do address that. Yes, there's concerns with China. Um, how many people, raise your hand uh, if you can, if you want, uh, remember that we were all worried about Greece, and boy, that turned out to be a farce, right? Um, Greece was not the issue, it was really China. Greece was just the smoke screen. You know, China was kind of the issue. Now everyone's conditioned to China this, China that. And it's China, 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 right? So I think what we really want to look at is if everyone's afraid of the market, why aren't they going into inverse ETFs and why isn't the volatility index seeing further upside? And I think the answer is we're not seeing a lot of or the entire segment of the market moving down right now. Utility stocks are positive by 7% on the year. I just wanted to go through this little workshop with you guys and take a kind of a review of what's happening here. Now, gold. This is the beginning of uh, the year. This is in January, February, and this is the seasonal trend. Some years it comes early, some years it comes late, but right now, gold. This is like the worst time of the year to start looking at buying gold. 
Gold this week did go up, no doubt about it. Um, let's take a look at the conditions of that rally in the gold market. So I'm just going to use a simple little tool, look at GC, um, and let's take a look at gold. All right, so gold broke out. Uh, we can see a breakout. And in just the final two days, uh, the final two days, yes, uh, we had Wednesday, we had Thursday, we saw a breakout. And oh my Lord, look what we see. What you're not really, uh, what you probably don't, uh, aren't aware of is that we have person's pivots. It's an indicator tool that defines based on market activity. It measures giving us a futuristic look at the end of each time period. So at the end of January, it gave us an idea that gold might be bullish. And if it is bullish, it might get up to that area. So in a, in a week period of time, you want to keep your eye on the market. Volume actually, as we made newer highs, and you got to admit, we made substantial newer highs from the last known peak right here. So again, daily chart, you can look at the, the price move, and what are we seeing? It finally got a little bit of volume in here to the upside, and what did we form? That's a blue candle, which signifies the market closes at the open, and it's identifying to us that the, the market has formed a doji, indecision. Stock market was down hard on Friday, big name uh, tech names had some follow through downside and gold doesn't have more follow through and I'm kind of looking at this uh, market and I'm going to change this to a higher degree time frame for you let's go to a weekly chart um, folks this is uh, at monthly person's pivot resistance we have number one number two would you uh, uh, if you were I don't, you know, you don't really need to be a rocket scientist, but um, we're pretty close. This high and that high right there, and it, that that close right there, and then over here. Would you agree we're kind of at about the same price level, more or less? And what I would be looking at here is maybe there's substantial volume accumulation, and people really are getting bullish on gold, and maybe this is getting ready to break out. Maybe it is going to 2,000. Well, the first thing I would say is on a daily chart, we have a doji, number one. And on a weekly chart, on the big move to the upside, we really haven't seen that huge volume accumulation to the upside. So I'd be a little bit cautious in here on, on the gold, chasing the gold trade. Um, odds favor the fact that we are going to get some type of a pullback uh, sooner rather than later. Um, this is GDX. This is the gold miners. And it did have a confirmed breakout. What does that mean by a confirmed breakout? I wanted to go through this and say a confirmed breakout is that this was a trading range. Everyone sees that. And that the market closed. Well, it's closed right here. Um, as you can see, we kind of closed. There we go. We closed almost just above, not the highs, but these old levels of, of closes and and we got right up in there, and you know, we didn't see as much uh, a stronger volume commitment in the market. So in GDX, I'd be a little bit uh, cautious there. Could we see a pullback? Typically, you see market breakouts, and then they kind of contract a little bit. So the real key for um, to find out is this a uh, a more confirmed move coming in GDX will be to look at to see over the next two sessions, which would be Monday and Tuesday turnaround, right? To watch how the market responds by Tuesday's close um, if we see a pullback. It would be more evident to see if the market is really going to do well. Um, my guess is that if, if it is going to have further gains this year, uh, it, it should have a more muted pullback, and then you start to see accelerations. It's going to be important over the next two days to see if this was just a two-day wonder and maybe that's about all we've got coming, right? So I would be watching GDX on a pullback, and I'd be looking forward to see if we get maybe a um, one of these types of patterns. Let's say over the next couple days, you get a, a pattern that looks like this, a doji, and then all of a sudden, the market, if you got a daily close underneath that doji, uh, I would be uh, looking to see confirmation that the volume moves down on that move that would not be a good thing. So watch for a doji and then 
look at the condition of the market on the pullback. I'm not a big fan of GDX right in here at this move, and uh, based on the fact that we have this really uh, sensational seasonal tendency of the market to um, peak out. So maybe we had the last gasp of, of, of buying coming in. You know, uh, gold, gold miners tend to move up. Um, you know, you start to see commercials in the next week where you've probably already seen commercials about K jewelers. So the kiss begins with K and, you know, Valentine's Day. People tend to run out and buy their loved one uh, or decide to get married and jewelry tends to uh, spark a, a woman's eyes rather than really flowers or candy. Um, being married for 28 years, I'm here to tell you, uh, a box of red Valentine candy from uh, Walgreens, it's not a good career move. It's not a good marriage move. I'm just going to throw this out there. Maybe a little box of Godiva, you know, but then make sure that you have some kind of a, you know, uh, uh, a special uh, gift inside there. Uh, for those guys that are just recently getting together and aren't familiar, younger, we have some younger viewers here. Uh, take my word for it. Don't get the little heart-shaped box of chocolate from oh, CVS. It it uh, doesn't doesn't bode well. Um, anyway, I wanted to go in and address copper, and which I already saw, but I wanted showed you uh, copper prices what they've been doing, and copper prices. This is the time of year where you start to see if there is a delay in the manufacturing, they start to order. And then they, they go, you know, if there is some increases. So copper prices right now, if you start to see it on the rise, um, because of the economic uncertainty, because of what's happening in China, the dollar weakened a little bit this week, I would be watching copper prices. It's the other product that I would be looking at to, to see, you know, if, if it is in a seasonally strong period of time, it's probably not going to go down. It won't because of this economic uh, period that we're in of doubt and uncertainty. I'm not really looking for copper prices to have a magnified breakout move, but you want to have copper up as a, a one of your indicators over the next uh, 60 to 90 days. I would keep that uh, forefront, all right? So that's kind of uh, some of the areas of interest that I see. I wanted to touch on this. It's, it's called um, kind of what we talk about a little bit today, sector weighting. And if you take a look at this, this little pie chart, I thought it'd be interesting to share with you. Um, we look at a breadth analysis on the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index. I mean, look at the, the, the sector weightings. Materials, 7%. Um, so it's probably not going to show up on uh, radar scans or radar screens as popping up as the big mover, right? What is? Healthcare, biotech, drug companies, right? Biotech. You know, oil and gas, 16%. Sure, oil's down, financials, uh, banks, institutions, 7%. Um, so between industrials is kind of populated up a, a little bit better than technology and telecoms and utilities. The NYSE, while many people feel it's a very broad-based index, the thing is it's it may be too broad-based. One thing many people might not be aware of, and I want you to, to follow here because this will make sense in the next minute, is that it has about 349 foreign companies. Why is that important? Um, folks, let's go over here to another page that we, we have created. Um, this is the NYSE. And this is something we call the breadth, the, the uh, comparative advanced decline analysis. right? So when we had the low, and this might explain why we didn't see in, increased volatility or demand for the VIX or demand for inverse ETF protection because it has different weightings in the marketplaces and one of the things that I would note is that relative to the close here at 91.51 to 93.89 level right 93.90 let's call it right so relative to that low and this close not the actual low note that the advanced decline the amount of stocks that have risen um, are starting to come off that low. Now, let me show something. This means how many stocks in that sector are doing better or worse. This is the NASDAQ 100. This is the same type of tool. This tool shares with us how many stocks in the NASDAQ 100. As you can see here, the current close on Friday is the lowest close or darn close to the lowest close 
that we've had since way over here, right? And look at the relative performance. You can see the purple line is a lot lower. And so what it means is that they are shedding some of these, A, what makes up the stocks in, in the NASDAQ 100? Biotech, technology names. You know, there's a couple big names like retailers like Tractor Supply, Costco, and Starbucks. But for the most part, heavily weighted to what? Some of the large cap technology names and the large cap biotech names. So the landscape of the technical tool is showing us the uh, NYSE, which has a different weighting of sectors, is performing a little bit better. The chart looks better. The condition, keyword, the market condition looks a lot better than the NASDAQ does. The NASDAQ just made new weighted uh, advanced decline lows. The NYSE didn't. The Dow didn't. The Dow Jones Industrial Average did not. Now, remember, in case you aren't aware, every single Dow component stock is in the S&P 500. Now, that's kind of what the difference is on looking at when I talk about uh, what tool is out there that can give us a gauge to prove what sectors of the market are doing better or worse. And right now, we know that the technology sector of the market is not doing well. And the funny thing is, seasonally speaking, it doesn't do well. So we could probably anticipate that it's not going to recover in, in the next week or two. Maybe a, a, a little dead cat bounce. There'll be some nibbling in there. But not to look for really strong, fresh money to come into it until maybe towards the end of this quarter, which is the end of March, into April. In April, my friends, spring comes and taxes come, and we have all new things happening. I wanted you to first and foremost get today a, a, a look-see at some of the technical tools that we're using, uh, some of the technical tools that are out there, the conditions of the market. And here's how I can help if you're interested in learning more. Uh, person's pivots, which we didn't get a lot into today because I, today was more of a, a workshop on what's happening in the market and what segments are doing well, what segments aren't, what type of price pattern to look at. Um, what might help day traders, what patterns can help um, option writing strategists. And I wanted to talk to and address the position trader and the investors and those who are worried about their 401k and their portfolios. Um, and that's why I said you really wanted to attend the session. I hope I helped give you some insights what to do. When you leave here today, go check your statements, look at what you're exposed to, and, and try to dig down a little bit deeper. And before you decide to just sell out everything and be disgusted, see what you're in, right? Maybe you need to clean things up. Um, I don't think that it's time to um, throw the baby in the bathwater out the window quite yet. Um, the stock market knows all. Let's just put it to you that way. It's the beast of burden. It knows all. It's the all-knowing. Sometimes it overshoots to the upside. Sometimes it overshoots to the downside. It's a very complex, as we've shared with you today, it has many different sectors, different weightings, and different influences that can make the market move. With that said, I think you, with, armed with a little bit more knowledge, you're going to be able to perform a little bit better or avoid costly mistakes. I think now's the time to address your portfolio and maybe uh, not day trade your portfolio or swing trade your portfolio or look at it on a month-to-month, -month, quarterly to quarterly basis. And I think at the very least identify that we have several sectors that are starting to perform well. They're coming off their lows. We mentioned transportation, industrials, and again materials, right? Um, and, and keep your eye on, on those areas. Technology might be in for a more of a change. The stock market does two things. It prices in uh, markets and it can be considered a leading indicator. Many of you are familiar with this, right? The stock market, if it goes down, it might indicate, while we don't feel like we're in a recession today, it's anticipating we might be in one six months from now, right? That Or nine months from now. And maybe the market's pricing in disastrous political changes and lineups of uh, what? Some fiscal policies that were enacted in the last eight years of administration. So the market's a little bit nervous about what might come down the pike. So I think um, you guys may want to be looking at a few things here 
And I think that one of the things that we can help you with is if you're interested, uh, we have put together uh, a couple things here. Number one, I've been showing you guys this um, platform uh, using TradeStation. Many of you are friends with, with me over at, at Thinkorswim as, as well. Um, we have put together something more so that we could get together as an analytical tool. It's just fantastic information. Um, you know, what I'd like you to do is if you're interested in learning more about what we do around here, just come visit our trading room. We, you know, we don't talk a lot. We, we actually examine certain things. Every Monday we do a what we call a um, planning and scanning session. I put down in writing my thoughts and observations. Uh, I think that's a, a key component. Many of you guys have been around and have seen that. Um, the recent weekly thoughts and observations for this week I thought was pretty impressive uh, knowing what to maybe expect out of the market. And I'm not afraid of sharing that with you um, because everything that we kind of talk about today, we look at, right? So um, we, we talk about looking at maybe market conditions, what could be changing around, what the uh, markets from a longer term perspective are doing. Maybe are we overbought, oversold? Um, what are the markets doing? Um, uh, as of last weekend, we were still in a weekly sell mode for the majority of the stock indices, um, but yet we still found some areas of interest in the market. Uh, some media stocks. This again, I want to. This is kind of amazing stuff because this is what found up on, and I think it's important to address this here. Um, let's take a look at look when it was created, January 31. It wasn't created after the fact, right? So. Um, we found that we were looking at a couple names. Um, CBS pop, populated, and we had a nice pop in CBS due to the uh, the head honcho resigning. Um, CBS, RIG, PXD, some of these names populated some nice buys. ETN, uh, this was a huge mover. In the transportation, pretty much all of those names popped. Uh, this is um, one of our big stars for the week. It was a $7 stock. It popped up to about 11 and a half. We did pretty well with that. Materials. You'll notice that nowhere here did we have anything to be looking at except for maybe CA and CTS and ETN. Which I'll take a quick gander with you. Um, in fact, this was a trade during the day as it happened, which was a warning to our investors and clients that the market was going to move down. Um, ETN, you'd say, gee, John, why would you look at ETN a week ago? Because this stock literally, Eaton Corporation, um, was firing off some significant um, moves. In fact, it completely defied gravity, gravity with the overall market. So I think it was, it, it's kind of neat to say, I don't think you start looking at selling everything. These were some of our bearish names for the week. Uh, probably uh, uh, the funny thing is Signet Jewelers is a story behind that, but that's for another time. I wanted to go through and just share with you guys what to, to expect, what to look for what we do around here, but more importantly, get you guys to get engaged. If Look at your portfolios. This is a, a volatile trader's market environment. This is not for the squeamish. It's for taking action, right? Don't be just looking at the market and saying, oh, what do I do now? So I want you guys to, to take, uh, take note. You can always find us here at Persons Planet. Um, we do in-house mentoring in our office down here in South Florida, which is a good time for you guys up north. Our presentation that the tools that we use, if you're interested in learning more about how we design and analyze the markets and look for trade setups, it applies to all aspects of the market. With that said, we've run a little bit over time. I thank you all for attending. If you, we are recording, did record, and so if you are looking for them, uh, and you want more information on it, please visit us at PersonsPlanet.com. I think you'll find them extremely powerful tools and in as far as educating traders how to be on the right side of the market, how to put things together. It's not just about the price, it's also about condition and it's about triggers and how to enact those setups. Do you use an option? Do you use it to maybe manage a portfolio? Those are the things that at the very least week in, week out, we manage to alert our traders to. So with that said, I thank you all very much. I hope you found use out of today's uh, morning workshop. It was designed to give us an idea that, wait a minute, 
the world's not really coming to, to an end in every sector of the market and not all stocks go down even in a bear market. So if you feel like you're less wealthier, your portfolio was probably overweighted to too much technology and too much biotech. And this, I think, uh, you will see in the next 60 to 90 days, uh, while it might not recover, it will weigh in on your conscious, it'll weigh in on your, your emotions, but you, you may want to look at some other trading opportunities to the upside, and I would be honest with you, I'm not looking at chasing the gold up in here, especially when we're in the seasonally worst time of the year to be buying gold. I think there might be some other areas with less risk, keyword, less risk, and more defined uh, reward opportunities. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attendance today. Have a great weekend and go to your favorite Super Bowl. You know, in our trading room the other day, um, we couldn't remember if it's NFC or AFC, then the market goes up or down. And I really don't think that's going to matter because it's not a, you know, when there's nothing else to look at, then you would probably look at that. But let's face facts. We, we definitely have a, a shift in valuation in the market, but not all sectors, as I hope I showed you today, are, are uh, the cats the, the cat's not out of the bag quite yet in determining that the big kahuna sell-off is coming right now. And I mean like a 30% 1929 crash that many of you might be fearing about. So with that said, watch the markets and use some of the tools that we've put out there for you to, uh, especially the sectors that we've identified today. Thank you all very much. Have a great weekend.